Welcome to the Werewolf Den, where we delve into gaming concepts behind White Wolf's Werewolf the Apocalypse. I'm Amelin. And I'm Ryan. Welcome back. Today we are going to be talking about the second tribe in our 13 tribes to discuss, the Bone Nars. Your favorite, if I remember correctly. Ah, uh, yes, they are, in fact, my absolute favorite tribe. And a kind of pertinent tribe for today's modern times. There's two tribes that could really be applied to current world situations right now, and Bonars is definitely one of them. Yep. So, without further ado, let's get into an analysis of the basics of the tribe, for those of you who are unfamiliar, and then we'll start to discuss more advanced concepts behind the Bonars. So the Bonars take as their tribal totem Rat. And Rat is quite different from a lot of the other totemic spirits. Probably the biggest thing is that Rat is unassuming, or perhaps better to say, uncaring about things like honor, your pure breed, things of that sort. The Bonars are the most accepting of the tribes, they're also the most numerous because they don't have these stipulations. It's not like with the Silver Fangs where you have to have this great lineage to get into the tribe. With the Bonars, if you can survive in the modern day, you're good enough to be in the tribe because it's it's no easy feat to survive in these times. The big thing with the Bonars is they are considered one of the two major urban tribes. Mm -hmm. Most of Werewolf is kind of considered a rule game because you have a lot of the players focusing on protecting wild spaces. And with the Bonars, their key aspect is getting down and dirty fighting the worm where it lives sort of deal. Yeah, they thrive best in the trenches. And that brings us to another one of Rat's big keystone points, is that Rat is a survivor. And not in the sense that, like, you know, Bear Grylls can go into a place and eke by with his, you know, television crew and, you know, the three things that he brings with them. The Bonars don't just survive, they thrive in these environments. One of the tribe books has this great analogy that the Bonars are like the dandelion that sprouts within the crack in the concrete. And they're this source of the wild still. They're, they are not a weaver-based tribe, not in any sense. They despise the weaver just as much as the worm. But like that dandelion, they're the source of the wild in these places that have tried to shut the wild out. And they consider that a point of pride, that they're there in the belly of the beast, in the worm's deepest, darkest realms. They're there continuing to survive. They're a sign of the wild, that you can't kick them out, you can't stop them, you can't beat them. They're there, and they're not going to be removed. Yeah, when you look at Rat's brood, it's full of things like there's obviously rats themselves which are notorious for being survivors within urban settings but you start also seeing things like raccoons mm -hmm. foxes things like that creatures of wild nature that have adapted to these urban settings and thrive within them mm -hmm. the other aspect of the tribe that very frequently gets kind of overlooked compared to this survival aspect, is this sort of defending the helpless. Last time we talked about how the Black Furies defend the defenseless. They're very much that whole source of, they want to give you a hand to raise you up. But one of the big things with the Black Furies is they'll give you a hand to raise you up, but then with the Black Furies, they expect you inevitably to stand on your own two feet. Mm -hmm. Whereas the Bonars, they realize that that's not always an option. Yeah, they have a much more perhaps benevolent way of sort of considering the downtrodden and the outcast. And yeah, it's all well and good that, you know, you're teaching this person to fish, but if you come upon a starving person, handing them a fishing rod and a tackle and lure doesn't necessarily save them. That sometimes you need that quick, immediate hand, that glimmer of hope, in order just to get to the next day, in order to survive. Yeah, and that's what we mean with the difference of defending the defenseless versus defending the helpless. Mm -hmm. At the same time, though, the darker side of Rat, I'll let you go into that. Well, there's one other thing I want to talk about before we get into the darker side of Rat, and that is that the Bonars are often sort of coined as the homeless werewolf. In much the same way that the Black Furies, like we discussed last episode, 
are considered to be the, you know, feminist werewolves. And while there's truth to both of these, like we said, with the Black Furies, that's an aspect of them that's not the center of their ideology. Like we said, it was creation, mm -hmm. right? And how feminism ties very directly into that. Now with the Bone Nars, this is something that the books have done a pretty good job of tweaking throughout the editions. Because at first, it was a bad stereotype. There was this concept of... I think at one point the text even says, like, Bonars are really bad with money. Whenever they get money, they spend it immediately, and they mooch off their friends, and their friends start to hate them about it. And it was very clearly an attack on poverty, and it didn't show a good understanding of economically dire situations or people who end up in homelessness because of medical bills or situations outside of their control. Later editions have done a really good job of sort of twisting that, and making it a much more wise understanding of economic situations. But I like to push it a bit further because the Bonars are very, very good at sort of living off the grid. A lot of their gifts, you know, we talked about the gifts of the Black Furies, how they're very mystical in nature. And we discussed that aspect with the Bonars and the Bonars have the best freaking gifts. I'll fight anyone on that. Their gifts are amazing, but they're focused on basically eschewing the status quo and thriving besides it. So they're very good at living within these urban environments, but they sort of hide out within the cracks, sort of like that dandelion. They're breaking the model that, that the system is supposed to have, right? We've covered this place in concrete, nothing should thrive here, and yet, argh, there's that bonar. So they're very, very good at sort of ignoring the way that the world is supposed to work. You're supposed to have a nine to five job. You're supposed to be a wage slave. You're supposed to consume. And the Bonars break all of these things. They are definitely anti-capitalist mm -hmm. in their mentality and in their outlook and approach to life. That is kind of one of the things that if you embrace this aspect of it too, it's going to avoid what is probably the worst Bonar player trope that players tend to have which we like to call the magical homeless person. Yeah, I think every single werewolf larp I have had the fortune to play in has had a bonar who just walks around with a bowl of gruel that they made with the cooking gift, passing it out for anyone to eat. And I, I, I feel that it just misses the point of the whole tribe. You are not this magical homeless person. It is, it is not meant to sort of glorify homelessness or make light of it, especially. I, I hate when it becomes a joke. The Black Furies, when we talked about them, they're considered a controversial tribe because it's very hard to separate the politic from the Black Furies. Mm -hmm. One of the big downsides of the Bonars is they have this built-in anti-capitalist aspect to it. If you are a fan of leftist Marxist theories and you have not played a Bonar, I I feel You're like out. you are absolutely missing out. missing out. But yeah, I, I, I think you're making a good point here. With with the Black Furies, there's like people don't like the tribe because it has these political aspects. But with the Bonars, people like them while ignoring the political aspects. Mm -hmm. And it, it's so deeply rooted and it's so unique, I think, within the gaming sphere in general. Mm -hmm. uh, the Bonar mentality and philosophy is so one of a kind. I've never seen it in any other genre, and it's executed so well in the hands of someone who understands it and thinks about it. Ah, oh, yeah. <laughs> Adrenaline's pumping now. But you had mentioned the darker aspect of rat. And within a rat colony, especially within the White Wolf mythos here and rat's outlook, there's this understanding that lives will be lost. And that it is the good of the whole that matters, not the good of the individual. And this really colors the Bonar outlook. Many Bonars have this perspective on the apocalypse that it is not only inevitable, but it's sort of happening now. And their job is to survive the apocalypse in order to carry on the fight. This means that many will die. Many in the Garu Nation will die. Some of the other tribes will likely be eradicated. But there's this understanding that so long as the, the community is still standing, the community can keep on that fight. If individuals die, it's 
it, it can be a sad thing, but it's not as crushing as it would be for many other tribes, per se, like the Fianna. So, this obviously has some pretty negative connotations with it. There are many Bonars that really embody the concept of eco-terrorism, and sort of pushing the boundaries too far of, if you're going to take out the worm, how many casualties are acceptable? How many innocent lives can be lost before you're failing at the zero-sum game kind of thing? Very frequently when people talk about making revolution happen, there's always the concept of what is the acceptable casualties because they are inevitable. And the Bonars full-heartedly are like, there absolutely are acceptable casualties. You'll get into other tribes, whereas the Black Furies will look at a group of women that are forced to labor under the worm's tyranny. And the Black Furies will be like, that is unacceptable. You can't eradicate them. They have to be saved. Whereas the Bonars are going to be looking at it as they're still working for the worm. It's sad, but they are part of a system that is part of the problem. It takes too many resources to save them versus just removing them kind of thing. So yeah, there's just so many aspects to the Bonars that I think are fascinating. They have aspects of the Black Furies, they have aspects of uh, the Shadow Lords, which we'll get into in a later episode. They're, they're just so, ah, there's so much going on with this tribe, I love it. Inevitably, one of the big things is this is probably one of the most popular tribes that mm -hmm. I've ever come across. Yes. I have never been in or ran a game that did not have a single player playing a Bonar in it. At least a single player. And it's one of those things where when you're storytelling for a game like that, where you have those Bonar players, you're going to come across one of two. Where, like I said, you're going to come across that magical hobo character, and then you're going to come across the player like what uh, Ryan Hewell play, which is that hardcore eco-terrorist who will silence strike and then disappear into the night sort of thing. Yeah. So I mentioned how, you know, Rat doesn't care about things like honor. There's, in the, in the Bonar perspective, there's no such thing as a fair fight, particularly when it comes to the worm. For this, I love to quote a uh, lethal interjection from the Boondock series. We don't believe in a fair fight, we believe in overwhelming force. Uh, and this is absolutely a Bonar mentality. This concept that why would you fight fair when you can fight dirty? Because the enemy is not going to fight fair. They're not going to agree to an honorable duel or anything of that sort unless it benefits them. So why would you even give them the benefit of that choice? Strike them when they don't know you're there. Don't let them see you. Don't let them hit you back. Be dirty. Be duplicitous. Yeah, they embody all of these concepts. So you can honestly, like, if you're somebody who's never played a White Wolf game before, a lot of players will sit there and be like, well, I want to play, like, a shadowy rogue type of character. And they'll completely look over the Bonars and be like, no, I, I don't want to be a dirty homeless person. That doesn't sound sexy. And it's like, but that's exactly yeah. how they fit. You are homeless because it is easier to live off the grid that way. The worm will have a much harder time striking you if you don't have a social security number that you use all the time, if you don't have credit cards, if you don't have a home that is listed that they can find on Google Maps, that makes it that much harder for them to target you. Yeah, the Bonars are just fascinating like that. The other big thing with the Bonars is that is more readily embraced by players is the net aspect of anti-hierarchy. Mm -hmm. The book frequently talks about how the Bonars are very frequently looked down at by other tribes. And a lot of players will take that as the whole, well, this is my way to shake my fists and create tension with other players, which is great. But it's also a thing where you can play with on the aspect of why do those tribes look down on you, though? Is it just because you're dirty and homeless? Or is it part of that perhaps... Hamid mentality of we live in an incredibly capitalist world and the Bonars are incredibly anti-capitalist and anybody who says otherwise is wrong, I will fight you. Yep. And within that capitalist system, they are the poorest of the poor. It used to be within the game system that you couldn't even have an income, which frankly werewolves shouldn't really be holding traditional jobs anyway. We discussed how rage has that effect on other humans. And so, you know, you cannot be a middle manager and a werewolf at the same time. You have other ways to get that income, but it's, you know, it's not through managing a McDonald's, you know, that sort of thing. One of the big things that we'll talk about with Fifth Ed right now is 
one of the big things they want people they want to make sure they drill into people is werewolves do not have day jobs. Yeah. Uh, you have kinfolk to make your income, or you have a trust fund, or something, something else. Yeah, you're not, you're not selling TVs at the Target, sort of thing. No, you're looting TVs from the Target. Yeah. And that's kind of the other thing, too. I mentioned before how the Bonars very much appeal to what's happening right now. They're kind of a very topical tribe if you want to. I've seen it all over Twitter. There's players that are hungry to play these games that let out their anti-cop frustration. Yep. The Bonars are the perfect tribe to do this with. Boy, howdy are they. There's only one other tribe that rivals them with this, and we'll get to that tribe later. Yeah, they're very anti-authority. And to sort of mirror back on that point, that's something where, especially in like LARPs, where you might expect that to be the case, doesn't always happen. And you know, we mentioned this with Metis, how Playing something that is considered to be an outcast or a pariah relies on other players being comfortable treating you that way. Mm -hmm. And so that isn't always something you can rely on in a game setting. Yeah. Uh, and there are ways to sort of sort milk of that and direct that. But I would be cautious about it because it can oftentimes... This is kind of why what I was kind of touching on earlier with the whole players will come in expecting to kind of shake their fists at the other players and the other players aren't comfortable with treating you like garbage like yeah. there's going to be a couple of them who are going to be down with playing in antagonists but inevitably players have been conditioned for good reason to get along with other players yep. so if you want to play up that i am a bonar look down on me sort of aspect you need to do one of two things. You need to do something that pisses your fellow players off. You need to be antagonistic. Mm -hmm. Or you need to talk to your fellow players and be like, please speak down to me. This is an aspect that I am looking for. Because Bonars are one of those few tribes that does not acknowledge hierarchy. Even when you get into the nitty gritty of how their tribal politics work, a lot of the other tribes have something called elders, where they acknowledge and revere you for being the tribe elder. Bonars don't have that. Closest thing they have is, is a mother and a father. And those are largely honorific. It doesn't mean that you are better than anyone else within the tribe. All are viewed with a very equal, egalitarian perspective. This is absolutely the tribe if you want to play an anarchist do it mm -hmm. but if you want to play that negative aspect of an anarchist you need to either be antagonistic or accept that you're gonna have to get that purely from your storyteller then mm -hmm. but yeah it is also a good tribe to select if you want to play someone who is rather passive or uh you know non-participatory because again, this tribe takes anyone who wants in. And a lot of the named NPCs within the books also sort of convey this. Probably from an NPC perspective is I think where they'd work best. Because they're just sort of there in the background, surviving, helping out the little person, uh, you know, trying to get to the next day kind of thing. Uh, and within a tabletop, I definitely wouldn't recommend this style of character. But within a LARP, I think it can help to illustrate that aspect of the tribe, that not everyone is this great aspiring hero. Some of them are just trying to get to the next day, trying to survive in the dregs of society kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And can work well as, you know, if you don't want to be out in the nitty gritty doing any fighting or anything, uh, you just want to be there for the role play or as an advisory position, Bone Nars can work great for that. It's one of those tribes where because it is kind of that anarchist tribe that has no hierarchy, it also means that there is no bottom of the barrel when you are a Bonar. Mm -hmm. And that's a really cool aspect of it. Yeah. One thing that we didn't talk about uh, with the Black Furies that I want to talk about with the Bonars are the different sects within the tribe itself. Because I think they're very interesting and very illustrative, but they can also be a little... Perhaps, what's the best word to word it? I feel like they can box you in a little bit. So one of the great things about the tribe book is that it illustrates all of these tiny cultural aspects of the Bonars. And so the Bonars are thriving within the lower economic classes of society. 
And so they're Anywhere. drawing. What? Anywhere. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and so they're drawing from a lot of the popular culture of these areas. So like some of the totem spirits that are sort of specific to the tribe relate to popular culture. So Elvis is a totem spirit to them and the great garbage spirit is one. But a lot of these I think are very, very cool for illustrating how you can really convey where your character comes from in this sense. The Bonars as a tribe don't really have an origin place. They they tried to put one in the W20 book and it does it, not It just work. felt awkward. It they, kind they of basically felt a little said, racist. Yeah, any place that is economically disadvantaged is where the, like, ugh, screw that. They're very cosmopolitan. They're all over the world. And so uh, one of the examples that they gave was the General Lee, uh, you know, the car from the Dukes of Hazard. So burn off the stupid Confederate flag, uh, get rid of all of that crap. You've still got this aspect of like, the poor person's car that they put a lot of work into, that they tinker with constantly to keep it running, they're using spare parts they get from the junkyard. There's a lot of, of love and energy and devotion and sweat put into this aspect of their freedom, their ability to move around. And so I think this is great. If you're coming from the Southern United States, you're coming from this poor strata of society, you can take these aspects of the culture that you've grown up with and make this something big within the tribe. And I think that's really, really cool. So don't feel constrained to use, like I said, the general lead that they have as their example within the books, but to take something from your place of origin, wherever that is, and really convey that within your character. I think the Bonar tribe book is very, very good and sort of encouraging you to express your character in that sense. They're very in touch with popular culture, so it, you know if you're into meme culture and things of that sort, it's another great way to sort of draw from this. I think there's a lot of ways to role play and express your character using these facets. Mm -hmm. With the Bonars too, but one of the big things that I would say also to kind of spice up those little flavor bits, it is when you're talking about those various different cultures, like, get into, like, the real, this is popular, but I don't understand why <laughs> sort of stuff within those cultures, too. Like, furries, you're going to have so much fun. You're going to have a representation in the Bonars, absolutely, spiritually. Um, otakus, absolutely, you're going to have representation within the Bonars. If you are kind of that sort of semi-pitiful aspect of it, or niche aspect of it, you're gonna find representation within the Bonars. They're the most connected tribe to human society and human culture. Even the, the Glasswalkers are sort of too high up in their ivory tower to really uh, embody that in the way that the Bonars do. Mm -hmm. well, A lot of their uh, other sects relate to aspects of society that are geared towards the common man. So one of them, for example, is called the Frankweilers, where they are focused on aspects of society that work to uplift the average citizen. So libraries, things like uh, theater houses to bring, uh, you know, poetry and culture to the average person. Uh, anything that has free admittance, uh, you know, that is a socialist program is something that the Frankweilers are going to uh, really espouse. And so uh, this is another example of how they're really, really good at sort of connecting to human culture and protecting the most downtrodden within society. I am now just kind of imagining with your example of just a pack of bonars getting in line for Shakespeare of the Park and just scaring and kicking out all of the rich people. <laughs> <laughs> so, right. that, so that only... For the people who are not familiar with Shakespeare in the Park, London does this thing where they get top of the line actors to for free perform Shakespeare in the park. And it's completely free. It's just a first come first serve basis. So if you want to be a Bonar, like a perfect like little niche thing that you can do to appease your spirits and get on their favor would absolutely be 
go to that line and kick every rich person that can afford to see Shakespeare in a theater out. Yeah, because the problem that they have with Shakespeare in the park is rich folks will basically pay people to stand in line for them to hold that spot. Uh, and so essentially a free service has become, you know, pay to play. Uh, so yeah, the Frank Weilers would absolutely do something like that. There's, there's just so much room to do something within the Bonar tribe beyond, you know, I work a soup kitchen, have some soup kind of thing. Mm -hmm. They're really fun to play. It's, there's a reason that it's one of the most popular tribes. Well, I don't know if that's exactly the reason why it's popular. I think that Magic Hobo is definitely a large part of that. But uh, yeah, to give the benefit of the doubt, I'm, I'm <laughs> sure it feeds in for some people like it does for me. All right. Well... I think, as a general feel, that's a good place to stop for Bonars for today. Mm -hmm. Later episodes, I'm certain we'll get back into them. Uh, yeah. They're Ryan's favorite, so we'll find ways to work them in. Bring them like, up whenever I can. Uh, just like I do with the Black Furies. Yep. But, for right now, I think that's a good place to cut it off. Next time, we'll talk about... Children of Gaia. Everybody's first werewolf tribe, basically. Kind of feels like it, yeah. <laughs> you guys have a good one. See you then.